thoughts? This is the NeoBooks call for Monday, March 18th, 2024. Sorry, Klaus, go ahead. No, no, I was just saying it has been really rainy. Yeah, and it looks like spring has finally, finally arrived, which is fabulous. Um, when last we met, we were talking about um, the agreement, the NeoBooks agreement. And I'm pasting a link to it in our chat. We have the spreadsheet, which is the result of the form. Uh, actually, it was just a spreadsheet. I didn't use a form at all. I think we were just entering our stuff in the spreadsheet. So uh, Stuart, Klaus, and I added our thoughts here. Uh, Dave, you're not on the list, but you could easily be on the list if you want to take a swing at this. Uh, and uh, uh, Stuart is not going to be back in our calls for a little bit here because he is in China. So it's very hard for him time-wise. Um, but part of what we were looking for was like, what are we doing here together? And what is the what are the promises and so forth? So maybe the, the agreement really is based a lot on Stuart's work and maybe we should postpone this conversation until he's back. But I'm happy to talk about it for a bit because I think this is important for us going forward. All thoughts welcome. And why don't I just wait a minute while we all reread and catch up with it again. And I can screen sh share it into the record, basically. So whoever's watching us can see it. Yeah, I don't know. I should take a look at it. I, I do. I mean, I have a, a little bit of a an update or kind of an insight, I guess, from some of this GRC stuff that we were doing. Please. Um, so so GRC has, you know, kind of these calls that repeat um, hosted by different people. And one of the calls has been regeneration and economics. And it's been going on for probably two years. Um, and um, the and sp kind of spawned by Michael Lennon, there's a conversation going on around, could we kind of codify or could we create a book out of the um, out of these calls? Hmm. And um, and we had a conversation, we'll have, we've been having conversations Friday afternoons. We had one last Friday afternoons. And um, I was really kind of excited about the notion kind of this is all because I've been stewing in this group here, I think, about the um, nuggets being the ideas that have been particularly exciting that have come out of the call. So kind of going back to the call. So not like not trying to not trying to organize all of the content. It's like we were, you know, like kind of thinking about, well, this could be the the Paul Samuelson's textbook for regenerative economics or something like that. But, mm -hmm. you know, we're not capable of writing that kind of textbook and that's not really where we want to be. But I think we probably could go and look at the calls and the conversations and see the ideas that sparked energy and collect a bunch of those nuggets and put them into chapters and have a pretty interesting book that, that I was thinking each one of the things that spark energy has the potential to be an epiphany generator. So we've been looking for this notion of an epiphany generator for, re for people to see regeneration as something kind of motivating. And so what we're looking for out of the calls kind of are the ideas or something that would excite people enough to do more, essentially. Um, and you're thinking about it mostly by harvesting existing calls and finding the shiny nuggets in them. Right, exactly. And, and the indicator being kind of the people got excited by the by the by the nugget right you could tell from the call that there was an idea that caught on yeah, yeah exactly uh, uh, that there was energy in the call that we're trying to we're trying to try to measure the energy in the call and grab the top five in in case the greater intelligence is listening um a feature that i was wishing zoom would add because they've added ai and a bunch of other stuff that i'm using now that i really like i think the ai summaries are pretty awesome uh there was a feature i turned on that i thought was going to give me back uh, an index, basically chapter summaries that I could paste into YouTube for the videos, but that has not materialized. But 
you know, uh, the, the minute seconds offset with a title, with a subhead for each of the section, major chunks of the chat, because the AI summary clearly understands the chunks of the chat. That, that's done. But another feature I would like love to have is- Time stamp it. Exactly. Another feature I would love to have is sort of to make a note to myself, oh, this is a great moment right here. And then to have the AI basically find the edges of that moment encapsulate that so that you could use the video or the transcript or any other part of it the way you just said. So that the finding and harvesting of that nugget was really, really simple because you would just be able to say, oh, this one over here, and it would it would already be findable because it would have a short summary title and you could then refer to it and add it into other media. That would be great. That would be sweet. Yeah. 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 So I don't know. I mean, I guess the, so. There's a couple of things that came. Just to, so one is this: uh, the notion of the epiphany generator is something we kicked around for a little while, and just like what. And I do feel like we hear from people's stories. That, I, you know, you probably you may be able to. So you probably can go back and tell the story of when you got focused on soil health, right? I'm I'm imagining you know the moment kind of. And there was there was an epiphany, and I have the same kind of experience for regeneration. I can tell you the day mm. when I'm like I got it, you know. And, and, you know, if you look at the epiphany, then you realize that actually there was 10 years of preparation that, you know, that led to the insights, but, but there was some, there was a spark. And so like, I, I was thinking that the book would be just kind of throwing sparks at people, kind of. And the notion is really around the learning, right? It's like, what we're trying to do is capture, or motivate somebody to engage more deeply, um, you know, kind of using the resources we've already got. And then the other theme I think we talked about a little bit last week is at the end is that I think we should do multiple media at once if we can. And so the the nuggets would actually have be in a book chapter, they'd be in a podcast, they'd be in a newsletter, kind of simultaneously, hopefully managed by different teams so that they're kind of loosely correlated. People are kind of loosely following the thread. Uh, they can you we can go back to the same materials they can contribute into the same materials but then they use them for their own media channels it, whatever works best for their media channel um super interesting uh out of curiosity uh what was the spark for you that got you to like click into it i was i was at a david hodgson workshop like the global leadership lab at fort, fort mason and he had invited Mark Barash, who's been doing regenerative agriculture work in Africa for a long time. And I just followed Mark. Mark we didn't sit through any of the sessions. I just kind of followed Mark around and listened to stories about regenerative agriculture. And it was something around the cascading benefits and the positive sum outcomes. Like I had come out of the EDF experience where we were trying to do energy efficiency for big corporations. And it's like, you could just energy efficient the hell out of these corporations and you still weren't going to do enough. You know, and so the idea that you could do something better than zero sum was really important. The fact that you could do many mul multiple good things simultaneously was really important. Yep. Um, you know, it's like, oh, so I just was able to see the world a little bit different. Love that. Thank you. Also, the time that um, you and Claudia and I went up to visit uh, Jumping Frog Farm was magical for me. That was that I've I've drawn on that and told stories from it a bunch. We went up to to see it north of Sebastopol. There was a regenerative ag, a regenerative farm surrounded by industrial farms, and and one of the stories I, I retold was one day they had a huge rainstorm and things were flooding and and uh, the woman and the woman of the couple who run the farm got a call from Elizabeth I think got a call from a neighbor saying hey we're flooding here do you guys need help. And, and Elizabeth was sitting by her fireplace reading a book because their regenerative plot of land was just absorbing and drinking in all the water. And it was, it was happy. It was just, it was soggy, but it was happy where next door they were having problems. They were going to have to harvest uh, crops early and do whatever else. And, and she just marveled at, wow, like, like the, the work we've done pays off in moments like this. Uh, so I love that. Well, and I think that's, I mean, that's like, I feel like it, from looking at the GRC experience, I feel like people, you know, people come at things from their own lens. See, I think you always have to accept their lens, right? You can't convince them to do a new lens. So there are some big ones like permaculture. A bunch of people come into these to the GRC because they've experienced permaculture and they start to see the world differently, I think. And regenerative farms, I think if you go visit regenerative farms, they're epiphany generators, right? You just, you, they feel different. They smell different, you know? So it's kind of like, I think we can almost build a list of these things that really are impactful and, you know, try to shove them in people's faces, basically. It's like, look at this, you know, or the idea of positive, net positive housing, 
you know, for, I think for a bunch of like architect types, the idea that, you know, they should, they should have an energy positive house or a water positive house, right? That's the challenge is what they think is, you know, possible and it gets people excited. And, um, and I love that idea of epiphany generators. That's a, that's really good. It's like, if you can sprinkle things around that get people to light up and get their brains to suddenly jump to the other side, that's perfect. And often, and often those things are tiny. Those things don't need to be big, you know, a thousand page books or, you know, major, major documentaries. Sometimes the insights are tiny and, and if, if well wrapped and if well wrapped and well tended, they can be really uh, transformative. I think, I don't know. Thoughts, that's, that's, okay, that's the, guys... And widely distributed too, right? Yeah, think exactly. Out there a lot. Exactly. I would argue that the smaller, the more transportable, right? Yeah. Well, because I've been arguing against the nugget notion until I put this, you know, it's like, oh, the nuggets are the epiphany. That's, that made sense to me. They're not knowledge per se, you know, because knowledge is only required, always requires context. The epiphany though, just is the spark. And it was not jumping frog's farm. It was singing frog's farm. And I was just wondering, worried about why I couldn't find it in my brain. And it's Elizabeth and Paul Kaiser. There was a, a Netflix documentary movie about a Biggest farm Little well. Farm. Biggest Little Farm. Yeah, which is good, but a little weird. Like at some point in Biggest Little Farm, they discover that ducks love uh, slugs and snails. And I'm like, you know, you just needed to go to other countries where they really know that. And they have herds of ducks that they put onto the rice paddies to eat up all the pets. It's like, yeah, it, it was a little weird how they presented that. But it, but it was a lovely documentary. I really yeah. enjoyed it. I was up in Napa this weekend and and saw sheep in a vineyard for the first time. Awesome. And goats for uh, clearing underbrush is big. They used to do that in Berkeley. They used to have uh, goats on the hillsides that would move with a little electric fence. Uh, they would just shift them down the hillside to try to eat all the underbrush to reduce fire risk. <clears throat> yeah, they, yeah they but could... the reason why they're using sheep and goats now is to avoid using glyphosate mm -hmm. to to eradicate uh, you know, the, the growth between the vineyards. Um, because nowadays a big thing about glyphosate free wines, there's actually glyphosate in wine, if you can believe it. Yeah, I can believe it gets in everything. Yeah. Hi, Stacey. We started out talking about the Neo Book Agreement um, and then wandered off into regenerative ag and the insights and into what Dave and some GRC folks have been doing about trying to create um contagious nuggets of wisdom or epiphany generators in their in their language good because the ai companion could not catch me up yeah. <laughs> it, told me, it told me that an error occurred it's too it's too recent i think the ai companion needs like a 10 minute lag or something to to actually catch up with the most recent conversation hopefully that'll that gap will close but thanks for trying <laughs> that's great David, uh, I've, been, me, I've okay. been working on, uh, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm continuously trying to figure out how to deploy AI in ways that is uh, useful to people, you know, in, in like like you would do to your a GRC crowd. And um, this explanation here that, uh, that AI gave on how to build an interface, a user interface, may also be applicable for you. Um, because the way this thing works is that you you build your chatbot basically feeding it the information that uh, that you have in your network. And it just stores it. And then you put an interface in front of this where you make it as intuitive as possible. Um, uh, and uh, uh, you can ask questions and it extracts the, the, the information out of it at the same time while your users are asking questions the, the, the chatbot learns right? it's like teaching it at the same time that, uh, that you're asking questions and then the chatbot itself is protected from anyone messing with it because you control it uh, or you you have a small team controlling it, um, 
And so the information that goes into it has a screen. Uh, you can make sure that uh, that it, uh, you stay online. So I asked Pete to give me a cost estimate, you know, what this would take to put on my website, either on my personal website or on the uh, 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 Climate System Solutions website, because we we want to build this interface and this and add a lot of complexity to it, so where you can ask uh, more specific questions about corp recommendations and you know, things things of that sort you know, technical questions mm -hmm. well and one of the ways i've framed that class and i don't know if this is what you're saying but i think of that at least as another another media channel so newsletter podcast book chat uh, yeah ai um kind of. mm -hmm. just so there's another team perhaps managing that yeah, it just it just uh, really simplifies your record keeping. This is what uh, companies are doing now. They're using these chatbots uh, to uh, to feed very technical, very specific information. So, like my son uh, working for Samsara, um, they have developed. They are developing this to the point where a mechanic uh, can go to the to the uh, chatbot and ask a very specific question about you know can you give me a blueprint for this specific piece of equipment how do i install this you know or how do i troubleshoot this and so um they even go so far now if you have the apple the new apple classes right mm -hmm. this thing can throw a diagram into your into your uh, classes so while you're working on this machine you can see <laughs> you can watch uh on your in on your monitor you know how this is supposed to work so the so ai is just integrating into uh into the regular workflow you know? and i think for 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 us wanting to uh, build a knowledge base um there is so much there are so many pieces of information for example the us government has uh created an interface where you can call, you can uh, put in the coordinates of a piece of land you're standing on or you're working with. And it gives you the precise, you put in the coordinates, it gives you the precise information about the type of soil you have, the, the local climate, local waterway. So it, it knows everything who owns it. He, he, it knows everything about this particular piece of land, you know. So to to use these, these databases and 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 integrate them for easy access is just such a powerful uh, uh, way to, to, to go forward. Um, Klaus, back in around 1990, I started a research service for new science called Intelligent Document Management. And it was, it was, some, it was technically meant to be about electronic imaging, which was taking scanning things and putting them on cold, sto on cold storage on optical disks mostly. And one of the presenting problems was uh, the nuclear navy, uh, the documentation for a nuclear submarine would fill a nuclear submarine. You you can't print the documentation for a nuclear sub and put it right. on a nuclear sub. So they have to scan it and put it on on disks. Uh, and so field repair, field service, has been one of the big, 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 big apps for augmented reality, heads up displays, whatever that kind of thing for years. And the the new Apple Vision Pro actually makes a leap in terms of the, the resolution, the technical capacity, the connectivity, all those kinds of things around the devices. But this has been a huge vertical for augmented reality since the since the early days. Yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, there are apps that, like I just put uh, one up there. You can put that app, integrate this app into your chatbot, you know, into your AI and. Uh, have a, a, a free and incredibly um, rich database to, that you can use. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, so what piece do we want to bite off in our conversation today? Where do we want to head around the, the Neo Books thing? I was going to head back into, Dave, you, you had mentioned nuggets meaning something different for you. I, I'm interested in that, but I don't know if everybody else is. Uh, I have a feeling that we should wait for Stuart to come back from China to talk about the agreement because it was we were kind of working on his agreement framework and it would be nice to have his opinions on that. Um, Jose, I put the let me let me re 
let me put the link to the Google spreadsheet back in our chat. Um, and Stacy, if you want to go look at it as well, um, if you guys want to enter your thoughts or corrections or emendations into the spreadsheet, make a column for yourself. I think, Jose, I think there's a column with your name on it. Uh, Dave, same thing. If you want to add your name and, and comment on it, you're welcome to. Um, but we don't need to go there, I think, until Stuart is back. Um, but I'm interested in what y'all are curious about from the NeoBooks perspective and that we might dive into it together. And I'm going to ask um, Klaus to explain the soil app thing, if you know more about it, because I'm really curious about that, the link you just put in the chat. Um, because I'm, I'm, I think you've heard me talk about. It. I wish that there were attacks on soil organic matter, meaning if your activities deplete soil organic matter, you pay a hefty tax. Meaning industrial farming gets dinged. Uh, if your activities improve soil organic matter, you get some of that money. You get a huge subsidy, and that would be a nice way of tipping agriculture toward regenerative. If that was a big deal thing. Your muted costs. Yeah, this this page uh, explains it here. Um, it's basically it's basically telling you um, what 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 your soil is like. Um, and uh, I I actually asked a farmer friend of mine to uh, who has been on my panels to play with it and report back how useful it is for him but if you take a new piece of land for example you you mm -hmm. you're looking at buying a piece of land this will give you the data that you need to see uh the history of this of this plot and uh it's uh type of soil most conducive for growing what types of crops that sort of thing that is cool. What does PKS even stand for? It's funny that they say, they assume in land PKS that you know what PKS means. Yeah, PKS, uh, I, I think it, <laughs> uh, it's the, the coordinates. That's so weird that nowhere on the homepage of this thing does it explain PKS. I, I, clearly, this is only for people who are in it. Yeah. Potential yeah. knowledge system. Potential? But you're right, land land potential knowledge system. So that's the whole acronym. Land potential. Oh, okay. Sorry, I was taking potential knowledge system as its own thing, but that's wrong. They're estimating land potential, mm -hmm. so you can't take potential knowledge system out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. They've been an example. Just this is just one example. I mean, yeah. there, there is so much stuff out there. See, and to bring this together into a knowledge system, uh, that's what AI is really good at doing. Yeah. And this project has been a little bit of an example of the open source stack stuff that I'd like to play with, because I kind of feel like they're probably, I'm, I'm not convinced that they're going to be very good at building the, eco the dynamic ecosystem that will lead to improvement of the system. Mm -hmm. <laughs> This no, is you have to, Go ahead. You have to actively search for it. You have to already know what you're looking for before you before you access it. Right. Well, and you also you need, you know, if 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 the you know it it has to, people have to be willing to contribute back somehow, right? It, it, this is this is back to the to the reciprocity problem. So um and which I think implies marketing and community building and a whole bunch of kind of human stuff. Um I like this example a lot. The the land PKS thing is pretty interesting. Um, so it dates back to 2013 is when the project seems to have started. Thanks for that, Klaus. Um, so which way should we aim our, our conversation? Um, Klaus, do you want some help mapping how to get from where you are to book? 
Well, yeah, I mean, volume one has been sitting there for a while. Um, it probably needs formatting, right? Uh, I haven't, uh, I mean, I've, I've gone through and straightened out text and so on, but I imagine it needs some help with formatting. It could use some better pictures in it. Um, I'm not very good doing my own. Pete is fantastic and uh but he he writes instructions that are <laughs> you know that are huge for to get to get the pictures out of it um yeah so it would be what are we going to do i mean where, where's ogm going with this right i mean i'm not uh, uh that much interested in publishing per se um but participating in an ogm neo book project this would you know we had in mind mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that kind of goes two different directions, if I can oversimplify. One direction is publishing the book and getting a Kindle book available to people and print on demand if needed. But the other direction is taking the nuggets of information and making them more interactive, more conversational, making them easier for you to send out to people, but then also making them some place for conversation and improvement of the nuggets, uh, which is kind of the, the idea partly is that the book is an attractor uh, and maybe also a, a um, an insight uh, generator um, that brings people into the conversation. And that, that's part of what we're looking for. Now, the conversational aspects of Massive Wiki, which is the platform we're using, are limited. The conversational aspects of Google Docs are kind of limited. I mean, everybody knows how to do comments on a Google Doc, right? That's kind of what we're limited to right now, is as long as the document still lives in a Google Doc. Um, the reason to nuggetize the document and get it out into Markdown was to make it available on GitHub, which has its own feedback mechanisms that are a little bit geeky, but also to make it available on other platforms. So for example, uh, Klaus, one thing you could do, um, I, I can think of several things that you might, might do. One of them is to look at your manuscripts, multiple, and figure out which of those would make really good Substack posts, because we did create a NeoBooks Substack um, on purpose so that we might kind of cheat and be Tom Sawyer getting other people to paint the fence to get comments back on uh, nuggets. And so if you wanted to look through your manuscript and think, oh, this piece, this chunk from here to here would make a good Substack post, do that. Copy, paste it into Substack. And if, if you pick some, some, some pieces that would make good posts, let us know and we can walk, you know, I can point you back toward the NeoBooks uh, substack we created and you could just paste them in uh, and go from there. That would work. Uh, another thing might be to ask ChatGPT. Uh, by the way, one of the ways that Pete gets really good prompts, long prompts for specific images is he asks ChatGPT to describe photos that are sort of like what he wants in detail. And then he uses the ChatGPT description to feed into mid-journey. It's 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 a it's a small round trip using the different kinds of intelligence that seems to work really well because uh, because uh, the image recognizers not generators but the image recognizers are actually really good about you know th th this is sort of the the theme that this is this is a dark and stormy night this is a happy whatever they they sort of pick up and and start to add a lot of emotional terms also which is really cool um, and and so. You might do that to generate, um, and probably with Pete's cooperation, uh, better images for your manuscript. And you might also, because some of these engines take larger um, corpuses, you might also submit the, an entire Google Doc to one of these engines and say, hey, could you make this flow better or whatever, uh, and see what happens. So I just, yeah, I just put in a link to the newsletter stack that I have uh, published on LinkedIn. Yeah, and the reason why I picked LinkedIn is because you know this is the a very professional, very targeted group of people I'm connected with there. Exactly, um, and so I've gotten some pretty good feedback on this. And these are basically nuggets from the book. You know, so I, I excerpted uh, these newsletters mostly from the book, or I wrote a new nugget and inserted it into the book as a new as a new uh, uh, chapter. Um, so you're already doing a lot of this just on news uh, on LinkedIn, which makes a lot of sense instead of Substack. Yeah, it's easier to handle, and 
I can still uh, send out a mailer to my mailing list, which I haven't really done much of, but I have uh, I have a mailing list that uh, goes into the Sierra Club, into the Regenerate America Network and, and uh, American Sustainable Business Network and so on. I got all their mailing lists, which yep. I probably shouldn't have, but I do. Uh. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, um yeah, so um, so I've been able to to get that out. No, so th what I'm what I'm really uh, and so when you when you read what uh, my chatbot wrote back to me, um, uh, it involves I mean doing you know uh, a UI and your user interface um, involves considering several key aspects to make sure it's accessible, intuitive. And engaging for your clients, so so the the and my clients of course you know are farmers, um, and they're they're practitioners. Uh, so the people are not uh, uh, deeply versed in using uh, GitHub and and uh, and uh, uh, IT uh, uh, products. Dave, I, I I don't know what you take, but I, I would say GRC also. Um, you have sort of moderate to medium level uh, skill sets in engaging IT, is this fair to say? There's probably a few folks that, I mean, it kind of has a little bit of, again, David Hodgson's fingerprints on it. So there's probably some people that are pretty competent, but yeah, most, and you know, I mean, it's actually, it's broader than that. And there's a bunch of people that can, you know, barely manage Slack. So. <laughs> I don't blame them. Yeah. So that's why um, um, putting it on a on a website, on a, or we talked about the platform, which is basically what that is, um, allows you to to interact with people who are, let's say, IT challenged, you know, but they can still read um, the instruction and then have uh, a way to ask questions or get their questions channeled. You know, you can channel them. Uh, towards uh, what they want to ask. So so that's the benefit of a website. Um, love that. Um, Klaus, it occurs to me, so the, the UI design question that you asked ChatGPT about and got a, a really nice answer to, that's a major project, right? Uh, that's, oh, yeah. a, that's a major UI design project. And I'm, I'm sitting here wondering, what orgs are already working on some piece of that that you could join forces with? Is there somebody out there who's trying to communicate to farmers, for example, about regeneration and sustainability and already building apps or a platform or a chatbot or something that talks with them where you could join forces? Um, because building, sourcing, managing this whole thing yourself is, I think, a, a monster project that I'm not sure you want to necessarily do. But if you could find somebody and connect up what you've got with what they've got, that could work out really well. Yeah, everybody is working on some form of AI. Yeah, I mean, everybody out there is is working on some AI. And but they are <clears throat> most most everyone is very proprietary. And right. what I haven't seen yet is this you are this user interface uh, uh, approach uh, where. Um, I mean, the, the 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 AI is used inside the company, um, and it's like Sam Sarah. The user interfaces they are building are highly technical, highly specialized, you know, for their workforce and so on. So I haven't seen a generic knowledge system, which is you know what what uh, the neo books that I've done so far really are. This is you know broad-based, you know, the big picture stuff uh, for meta level, but then also going way down into the, uh, the specificities on your soil, you know, and, and uh, the uh, carbon cycles and all of that. So so I think there is an opening. I, I wish I knew somebody to partner with, but I, I, I haven't found anybody. Stacey, go ahead. Um, so, as an OGM project, as I had written back to Klaus when he sent us the volumes, I was just wondering if a call like how to train your chatbot would bring in different people for like a cross section of people 
at different <clears throat> levels involved in, dis in different disciplines, just as the basic opening conversation. And then you might find people that want to go further, but at the same time, we'd also be having discussions that we're looking to have and bringing in different disciplines so we get a whole systems approach. Just a thought. <laughs> so you're saying host, host conversations then invite more different parties in? I'm saying that at least one conversation that's billed as highlighting the work that Klaus has done and the way he did it using, he already has it written up in that methodology part and seeing who comes in. Like I, I'm thinking somebody like Dave, would, wouldn't you want to come and see how he trained it so that you could use it for what you're doing? Or I'm, but I'm also thinking other people, maybe more technical people mm -hmm. would also come in. Again, it's, it's just a thought. I mean, it's, it's interesting in a lot of ways. You know, when I read it for a lay person like me and I read just the methodology part, I was very interested. I like my mind was going in a hundred different places in terms of applications and things like that. And I'm sure people, I, I'm thinking people would come for different reasons, but that whoever, I'm thinking it would be a rich conversation and from there, it might split off and you might see a lot of overlap in things that people are doing. The other thought that I have when I think about chatbots in general is, wouldn't it be nice if a teacher was training the chatbot with the use of her student, with the help of her students, so that, so that teachers and learners are doing it together? Because again, it's, it's about doing, <laughs> so. That would be great. I had an idea that was sort of similar to your first one, Stacy, which was, um, Klaus, you just showed us your LinkedIn newsletter. Could you ask those newsletter readers if they're aware of any open source efforts to do something like this? And you could kind of spec it out. And then that could be a beginning of the call that Stacy just mentioned. So, you know, just, just post one of these things that isn't a, a description of something, but rather a question to your readers who now have, they know what you're writing about because they've been following you for a while. You can scroll up and down through the newsletter. Um, so some of them might actually know what's going on. Well, I mean, it, I'm, I'm sort of uh, in a weak wounding phase. You know, we have this group of farmers in the Palouse. Um, there's 34 farmers. The smallest is 3,000 acres, and then it goes up to 20,000 acres. Um, and they have this uh, Shepherd's Cranes uh, 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 company that they uh, that they created, and it's uh, um, it's an uh, organic, uh, 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 regenerative-based uh, uh, flower that they that they're selling Shepherd's Cranes. And uh, they they are they are very uh, progressive in in ways of wanting to you know uh, improve the soil. In fact, on their website, they're talking about how degraded the Palouse has become. You know, they're losing something like fourteen tons of topsoil per acre per year. You know, in, in with their uh, with their industrial methods and so on. So to engage with these farmers, um, I, I'm trying to pull together a value proposition. I have a meeting next week, Tuesday, I just talked with Jordan this morning, because I'm 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 struggling to put together a value proposition that would make it worthwhile for them to work with Joel and I, uh, my partner and I, and and a larger infrastructure that may be a, a, a larger network like uh, Linesburg that may be interested in participating here. So I'm looking at AI as a differentiator. You know, I'm looking at this as a tool um, that you can bring to bear that gives you just a ginormous head start in, in uh, framing strategy, uh, in, in drawing on knowledge uh, bases and so on. Uh, so, so that's where I'm at right now. So I just, you know, uh, because if we can pull this off, and this is a big if, um, we could have a prototype project in the Palouse uh, that that would be holistically regenerating a community. You know, it's not because most everybody is so siloed. You know, uh, they're focusing on um, 
getting organic flour or you know re regenerating this field and but what is what is typically missing in the conversations is the need to to also look at the socioeconomic impact of the changes you're wanting to make what does it do to the jobs does it create local businesses are you engaging the ngos locally you know so i mean for example in Benz, there is a family kitchen they're serving 20000 meals a month to uh, uh, homeless people and to you know impoverished people um why why can't this be a revenue generating thing? The federal government spends $182 billion on nutritional assistance programs. Can that money be repurposed so that you empower people to source local uh, local and to source a finished meal and then and then in the process fund these NGOs instead of uh, going going after donations, they can actually generate a cash flow. Uh, and and sustain themselves and then buy local right so so ju i'm just spinning off you know, a whole bunch of stuff that's sort of sipping through my head uh, lately but um so to create a a regeneration project that is holistic right that, that in, engages the entire community ground up um that's what i would love to to prototype there and we have a shot, you know, the Palouse has Washington State Extension, Idaho State Extension. You know, these are very uh, significant uh, research institutes. Um, it would be amazing if we can uh, get in there and, and get people interested to participate. Um, am I hearing you right or wrong that this could be a field manual for regenerational interdependence? Well, it could be... It, uh, I'm, I'm looking, yeah, it could be, uh, 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 I mean, it's a training manual for the, uh, for the AI, right? Because there are some things in there that I wouldn't necessarily discuss with a farming community like spiral dynamics, right? Right. Um, I mean, that you would end up most likely offending people <laughs> bringing that stuff in there. But 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 the AI needs to know it, and the AI needs to use it, you know, in order to structure conversations so they're context specific to yeah. the people you're, you're communicating with. Um, but there are other and and the things that I that I uh, think need to be communicated by and large, I have already put into these newsletters. Now, mm -hmm. but the AI needs to know that there is you no know, 10,000 years of history related to agriculture and civilizations have come and gone because they screwed up their soils right. uh, and they, they mistreated uh, their environment. Thank you. Uh, anybody else with thoughts? It's Klaus. I, I, uh, Kevin Jones was on a GRC call last week and there's a recording in this chat, but he's uh, the, the financing mechanism he's using via DAPS might might be interesting to what you're talking about because there's like a community engagement part as well as an investment for return part. Yeah, definitely. I think Kevin, if we can pull this off, if we can get these folks interested, you know, then you can bring in uh, uh, partners that uh, are more specialized in. We are looking at ourselves as innovations brokers, so it's a brokerage function, right? So because we can't do everything, and I mean, you, but the two of us. What are we going to do? But we are, we are experienced in the industry. You now we have both been experienced leaders in in large scale operations, and so maybe we can bring together a strategic development, strategic guidance, you know, and and uh, and explain resources that are required. So bring resources to bear um, uh, more more in that direction. But Kevin would definitely mm -hmm. uh, be a great partner in there. Yes. Um, speaking of Dr. Jones and his work, uh, he's um, for years he's been working on something called the Asheville Community Funding Kit out of a project he has called Neighborhood Economics, and that's all connected. And I was just wandering around in my brain, and I found this, the four elements of neighborhood funding, which is very specific, but a giving circle, a kids community savings bond, a lending club, and a pool donor advised fund. I found it because I was looking up donor advised funds, which are over here, but this community funding kit feels like a similar project to what you're doing, Klaus. It's just that the audience is different. 
and the focus is funding, not regenerative ag. But th this this kind of kind of structure or arrangement feels very simpatico to what you're trying to get done. Yeah, and like like there's a bunch of overlaps, and maybe um, in, in a conversation with Kevin, you might be able to pick up and reuse some of the component parts that they that they used. And I I don't know uh, what success they've had, but I know that he's done lots and lots. The way you've been working with the farmers in the Palouse, he's been working with uh, local people in Asheville, which is where he lives. Yeah, but I, and just to like put on a consultant's hat, Klaus, it might be easier to go in and say, look, we'll help. Don't they need a mill? Isn't that one of the things you said they needed? To? It's like, don't give them the whole, we're going to strategize everything in the world approach. Give them the, we'll fund your mill. Mm -hmm. Make yeah. it really simple and answer their question directly. The rest of it grows out of the first engagement. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. And I have and, to keep and, going. And Kevin's idea was a very kind of like immediately doable strategy. It, it, you can kind of pull a couple of pieces off the shelf and it may or may, they may not work, but it was like, it seemed really kind of implementable. So, yeah. You, you said you had a link to Kevin's uh, conversation there? Uh, it's in the GRC stuff. Uh, I'll, say, uh, I'll find it. I'll put it in the chat. Thanks. But I mean, I don't know. The quick version was, and I, I know this, this is totally off topic, but but the uh, he you he's got uh, you can you can he found that he has a DAF that you can donate into for two hundred fifty bucks. So we could all donate into the DAF, mm -hmm. and then I think it's another entity can aggregate the donations at the, up to like a five thousand dollar minimum, and invest them. So it's so you donate to your DAF, and then the company takes it and invests your donation into a, a mill. Um, and you get a tax deduction on the input side. And then if the mill pays itself back, you get return on the investment on the house on the other. It's a, it's a little bit like Kiva, but it's got a community component. So you go into the community and say, donate it to the staff. We'll we'll build a mill, you know, and Go ahead, Stacey. I believe that's the topic of the first call he's doing with his daughter, BJ, um, at the local school Wednesday from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern. Cool. cool. Thank you. Good, good, good connection. And I think we have a link to that in somewhere in the OGM verse. Uh, he shared a link to that session that they're doing. Totally agree with you, Dave. To keep it to 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 keep it simple, you know, we have this entry. It, it's it's the, there's the requirement of a mill on the one hand, and then the other on the other side, you need a CPG manufacturer, consumer packaged goods manufacturer, so that you have a market. Right? Now, if you have those two, then you can figure out what else needs to be there, aggregators, logistics, and so on and so on. But it's, it's, that's, uh, we have a CPG person. They just got $3 million of a federal grant, you know, because the federal government is working hard, is really in pushing the connection to uh, markets. You know, they, they, uh, they have allocated several hundred million dollars to marketing for, uh, uh for farming uh, for for uh, regenerative farm systems well thank you um so kevin's call was a grc call yeah um so do you guys not as a matter of habit just post all your calls on youtube no they're i mean no um We've been, I, kind how, of, how come no kind of Adam House rule. I mean, a little bit just the overhead cost. Oh. We're, we're too lazy, but a little bit Adam House rules. So kind okay. Of so to, ma to maintain privacy, I totally understand. Like, like for almost all the OGM calls, the understanding is I'm going to post them openly to YouTube, and the work of posting them is not that great. I it's, I, I, I down I download them, I archive off a copy to my you know external archive hard drive so that I don't lose them forever, and then I upload each call to YouTube. And I do one or two other things. I post them into our Mattermost channel so that we have links, so that there's a place where you can go find all the links to all to the calls. But it's not that it's not that much work, um, and it yes. creates a great record for other people. Um, besides, if you just pointed us to your Zoom uh, repository, that means there's a whole bunch of Zoom calls still on Zoom's servers. Now that's expensive. 
<laughs> it's going to be getting more expensive pretty soon. Yeah, I got to figure something out. So, yeah. so actually, that is much more clumsy and expensive than getting anybody to do the work of just downloading and uploading the call. You could you could hire a high schooler to do it probably for nothing. Yeah, I should probably re revisit this. But I, there's also a theory behind it, though, Jerry, which is the the point is not to capture the knowledge. The point is the energy in the conversations. Yeah, but I find you the can do arc both. Of the long tail is. I find well, there is a marginal call. Yeah. Um, and so I mean, anyway, I mean, you know, it's like there, there's if people really want stuff, it's kind of in the Slack they can find it. But I'm my, I, you know, I'd be interested to know. Actually, you should. We could probably go back and look at the OGM calls. Uh, how are they visited? You know, do, do uh, what's the viewership look like? Um, so they get some viewage. They get, in fact, one of my dojo mates surprises me now and then on Thursdays by saying, ah, I watched your call this morning. Uh, I really liked when so-and-so said X and Y. And I'm like, well, damn, somebody's actually watching. It's, it's really kind of cool. And he, yeah. speeds us, he speeds us up to one and a half or two X so he can like, you know, get through a bunch yeah. of calls, which is great. I think that's terrific. Um, so there is a little light viewership. But, but the fact is you are recording these but then not doing anything with the recording. If you were not recording as part of Chatham House and then like whatever, I'd be like, great, but you've got this recording just sitting there. I feel like the, it, it, is, it isn't it is a heavy lift to put it online to make it available for anybody to listen to uh, later. And that I, th I think there's this unspoken emergent potential benefit from doing that, from making it more available. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical but um i'd say that i'd say that we are right that we are recording them but the notion has been recording them for the rest of the community but yeah gotcha okay i, I won't i won't go on that more i'm just like i i'm i i try to nudge people toward well and, and i've been and i have been like zoom is hitting me with that you just about filled up your uh your allocation oh, thing and it's which is like going to be a forcing function on what so one so. of these one of these calls fills up my zoom allocation because i've got the juniors zoom account. yeah no, I've, got, I've been paying the monthly one but i've uh, got the yeah. i've got the entry level zoom and it fills up after one gig or a couple of gigs worth of call which is just one or two calls max yeah. so if, if you're not moving them off your zoom yeah they're going to be very happy to collect your money yeah um cool other thoughts on this, Klaus? Did that help at all? Are we? Um, did we come up with anything that's that's helpful to where you are? I mean, <laughs> it's. Uh, I, I mean, I still need to figure out where to go uh, with this book, um, and and where you want to go from OGM, you know, right. with new books, uh, and and uh, I would invest time and energy into it if i knew where it's going so um a couple things uh, one tactically um when people make comments on your linkedin newsletter posts are you using uh, do any of those comments make their way back into the manuscript are you using those as feedback for what's written in the manuscript at all you know you'd be amazed i haven't gotten one comment yet it was other than complimentary this is great yeah i'm thinking really? this yeah, I mean, uh, virtually all of the comments are uh, sort of uh, supportive, right? But it's not like, hey, you missed this, or you need to include that thought. Which means that the manuscript may be in better shape than than I think, than we think. Um, okay, so, and then we had a call a couple weeks ago for a Neobooks call, where after, just after Pete and I had talked, where we said, hey, um, Neobooks is not a publisher, which means we can't do the lift of the editing and all that. So we, we need to find or crowdsource some of the editing. But Pete with Jordan has very successfully taken a Google Doc and put it into, I think they use Lulu, but I'm not positive. Mm -hmm. I, think it was, I think pretty sure it was Lulu. Yeah. But, but that, that process is known. So, uh, so Klaus, if you uh, wanted to say, hey, let, let's do what Jordan did and see what that ends up with, that could work. Uh, you might also, I don't know if it'll do this, you might also be able to use ChatGPT or one of the other engines to clean up your manuscript in terms of whatever formatting you want to add or create so it's consistent. Uh, and so it, you know, so it folds into the book format uh, more elegantly. But I think that the process of pouring the book into the Lulu process and seeing what an ebook would look like, because I think they did it. Um, I think when when Pete and uh, Jordan had a they had a Zoom call at the end of which Pete was like let's hold off let's hold off and then Jordan just went and pushed the button afterward and made the book 
uh, at which point they discovered some errors that needed to go, they needed to go back to the manuscript to fix. But that seems like a normal part of the troubleshooting for this whole process. So I'm like, can you just push that button and get, get really pretty far down that path and then see what happens? Yeah. Yeah, I can talk with Jordan um, and and see if he if he's willing to help with that. Yeah, sounds great. And you could generate some cover art. I mean, um, if you post, uh, if you were to use the OGM Town Square channel or the NeoBooks channel on Mattermost and say, "Hey, I'm trying to I'm trying to fix six images," uh, and I'll post for each image, I'll post a description of what kind of what I'm looking for, and then several people who are interested in images might actually generate some choices for you and yeah. you can then swap those in yeah that sounds like a good idea uh, but if you just pick you know nibble nibble away at the different questions you have about how to perfect the manuscript and then just go through the manuscript in see what happens because the, if you're getting feedback that says thumbs up that's great that that means like go for it yeah yeah, I mean, you can see the comments when you when you yeah. uh, click on the newsletter. You know? When we hang up here, I'm going to go back and take a look. All right, go ahead, Jose. So um, I'm feeling the energy to uh, to move things in sort of two two directions. One, um, how do we do the technical stuff of a neo book? By that, I don't mean publishing, but organizing nuggets and so on and so forth. Um, and 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 having some kind of repository mechanism for that. Um, and and of course, at some point, some interfaces to to provide all of that. So that to me, um, me it feels like something new. Um, that we don't currently have, at least from my perception. None of the tools that I've heard so far sort of fill my little mental image of what that looks like. Um, I think it's more than just um, the tools that we've spoken about. That's my sense. Uh, the other thing, which I'm probably a little bit more excited about now is is more the idea of the marketing of a neo book and not a neo book as a book as a single book but a neo book as a concept of neo books and uh, i start thinking that um maybe we have enough um to make a little noise about neo books to the OGM community, to our respective communities, um, and and the broader communities, I should say, and actually start doing some events where we talk about what these things are, what they look like, who's already working on them, what are they coming, turning out to be, and exciting people about something a little bit more clear than I think we have. Uh, you know, uh, that maybe we'll, the forcing function will be something like that. That if we have to go out publicly speak about these things, that we'll have a forcing function for some clarity about what the role of a, a neo book is, what the uh, expression of a neo book is, and, and maybe start having a, a conversation with a broader group of people as to how we do this as a community and not as uh, you know a, a small book or a small uh, set of of uh, nuggets that latter part the the sort of the forcing function community piece um i think uh, is something that i think would be very interesting to explore um and would give me um a sense of, of of the direction where we could go towards uh, making this thing a. I feel like there's so much potential in this, and it's just somehow not materializing itself. Um, and yet, I think forcing ourselves to materialize it kind of creates the the reality that we all seek. 
Um, let me take a swing at answering, and then anybody else who wants to jump in, please do, do, do as well. Um, one of my favorite TEDx talks is by a guy who, the guy who founded Better Block, uh, and I think his name is Ben Roberts or something like that. I can find it, Jason Roberts. And he's jumping up and down, and one of his tips is blackmail yourself. He says, I had no idea what I was going to do. He lives in South Dallas in a really ugly part of South Dallas, so he created a flyer that said, show up on this date at this intersection. And he, he had no colleagues, he had no budget, he had nothing, he just had an idea. And that forced, that was the forcing function that made him go do stuff. So he and a bunch of buddies found a nursery that donated some potted trees that they put on the edge of the, the, the intersection. They painted a bicycle lane into the intersection themselves. They put a cafe table and served lattes. Uh, they put a sign up on the wall of the empty warehouse that called it the Oakville Oak Creek Arts District. They did a bunch of other things. They, they also printed out city ordinances they were violating and put them on that brick wall just in case any city officials came by and said, why aren't we doing more of this, right? That's all in his TEDx talk, which I'll, I'll paste in the chat. So, so I've been sort of trying to blackmail myself without much effect because I'm not a good manager of me, but I think making this public and doing this together would be a great thing and I would happily participate in that. Second thing is, uh, in terms of organizing and archiving, what we have so far, it, because, because Massive Wiki is our engine, or at least my engine at this point so far. The way to organize a neo book is really as a directory or as a vault in Obsidian, and um, uh, and really um, because a neo book is a roll up or a playlist of nuggets, then the nuggets just need to be named in the vault, and they can be in flat namespace. They can, they can just be one big namespace. It doesn't matter. And then I have a table of contents for the Neo book that I'm writing about design from trust. That table of contents is the organizing factor Then points to nuggets, basically by naming them, by including them. And then the, the concept here, the conceit is that we say, hey, create me a Neo book from this table of contents. And it then goes out and fetches and includes properly formatting and all that kind of stuff, which gets a little bit complicated, the Neo book draft text. The other piece that's missing that's on my wish list in conversations with Jordan and Pete about making Massive Wiki better, the other piece that's missing there and is a non-trivial piece of code to write is some kind of a dashboard that tells you how far along you are in writing your Neobook. Um, I was a Scrivener user for a while until I realized that you can't take a chapter out of one Scrivener manuscript and cut and paste it into another one. That is an impossible thing to do. And I was like, God, this is stupid software. So I stopped. I got backed out of Scrivener and I've tried copying and pasting all my Scrivener stuff back into Obsidian Markdown Nuggets. Because again, you can just draw a circle around any subset of nuggets you want, call that a book, sequence it by writing the table of contents and you're off to the races. But we don't have the extra code that makes it look pretty or understandable. The piece that we're missing there that I think you would really need, Jose, is better use of metadata. Because I think your model for the building blocks and the foundational elements of the logic of the structure of the book that you're looking for would exist in metadata mostly. And there is a thing called YAML, which is a way of adding metadata into Markdown documents in a way that's kind of invisible, but sort of visible. It's clumsy. It's not beautiful, but, but, it's, but it exists and it's well known. And Obsidian obeys YAML. And there's there's some Obsidian plugins that do that, so that's possible. But I think to get to the level of structure you want, we would need some funding or some ability to to add add back in some YAML capacities. And then you you could go ahead and tag up everything you wanted in 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 a manuscript that you were writing. So that's that's on the wish list. That's not anything we have uh, like working. And for me, all of that is is much too not for me personally. I, I I get that I would be able to do all of that. Yeah, I just don't think that that's that's the way forward. That's much too technical for the average person who might want to write something because of Obsidian and GitHub, or because of something else. All of the above. Yeah. Okay. Obsidian, GitHub, YAML. I mean, it's it basically. I I like I said, what I have in my head is it's closer to what Klaus talks about, let's build an interface that makes this uh, explicit. Here's a bunch of fields. Here's what you put in the fields. 
here's you know here's the metadata well, associated that's what the, with this block that's what the dashboard would do it would basically give you an interface that would let you do that in a user friendly way without having to know all the yaml and do whatever else that that's why and obsidian is friendly here partly because it looks like a word processor and it's a nice it's an elegant word processor and it has this big ecosystem and community of plugins and extensions which is where you can the, the space where you can build out the interface it could be done clearly somewhere else but for example i don't know how to add metadata to a google doc in any functional way i don't know how to do that because everybody knows how to write a google doc and how to add comments to a google doc i love that about google docs love exactly. it exactly but i don't know how to program all this stuff into or onto google docs um so obsidian is for me the next best alternative despite its crankiness but if we manage to build out the parts there would just be a dashboard you would like you would launch your dashboard it would know about I need to crank up Obsidian to this document because Kose wants to uh, wants to edit this nugget. Fabulous, done. But it would then say, "Oh, okay, this nugget is eighty percent complete. Check. Uh, here are the 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 the, uh, the structural elements that Jose wants to add to the nugget. Check. And you wouldn't need to know about that that, that they're being hidden in YAML or something else like that. But that's ahead of where we are by by a ways. Right, unfortunately. Right. And then I wanted to address a little bit your, your marketing thing too. Um, we've said a couple of times in this call that we need some explanation of what Neobooks are. And I've been working on that as like an introduction to Neobooks. And I agree that it needs to be better and livelier. And I really want to have that, but it's not done yet. Um, but that would be a place to start with, hey, here's an explanation of what this Neobooks thing is. Uh, let's start there. And now let's go go do something more with it. Sorry, Klaus, go ahead. Yeah. See, that's, I'm sending in here, this is my most successful newsletter, <clears throat> which I in if you what, had over a thousand clicks and has quite a few people who commented. If you go down to the comment section, you, you see how interactive uh, that was. Um, so to have a, a newsletter like this really... Um, um, maybe the kind of nugget, I mean, it's a nugget, right? Because it comes right out of my new book, volume one, um, where bioregion was in the one in the, of the first chapters I wrote. And that has really circulated. And now, you know, not because of me, but right now bioregion is the big conversation, right? Mm -hmm. And then what's, what really, uh, uh, what the chatbot pointed out, you know, when asking the question of building a user interface, it says simplicity and clarity, right? And for, for us, what means simplicity and clarity is not the same as for most people, you know, who uh, don't know anything about programming or uh, not any of the tools that we're using. You know, clean layout prioritizes ease of reading and writing messages. And when it says aligns with beige and purple, that means with the entire uh, spiral, right? Goes bottom beige to top uh, purple. Uh, basic needs of community designed with inclusivity in mind, ensuring that people of all abilities can interact with the chatbot. So we, we uh, for OGM, there's a real risk now that we build something geeky that uh, uh, doesn't that doesn't circulate? It just doesn't resonate. And so that it, uh, it's some easy user interface. You can uh, put pictures in there. I mean, just real simplify. Looking at your audience. Mm -hmm. Do these Obsidian uh, interfaces, uh, the, the the dashboards that you were referring to, um, they already exist. Somebody's already built some of these. There are lots of Obsidian widgets and extensions. I don't know that there's a dashboard of the kind I'm describing yet. But there's a whole, there's a pretty large and thriving ecosystem of geeks and coders who love building stuff into Obsidian. There's also a thriving ecosystem of YouTubers who explain what they did in Obsidian to everybody. <clears throat> there's some Substack, <clears throat> Substacks that I sort of follow. There's one called TFT Hacker. There's another one by my friend Wes Boyd not West Boyd, uh, Stow Boyd, uh, who are talking about their exploits in Obsidian and how they coded this and, and whatever. We, I, don't, I haven't done a search through the community of Obsidian plugins to see if anything like this is, is present though. Go ahead, Stacey. 
just real quickly to my earlier point, I think that being able to contribute artwork could be a draw for those nerdy types you're talking about. So they come just in community, but then they're motivated to do the techie stuff because they get to put their artwork in something that they don't usually get to, you know, that's something usually they do in their free time, their spare time. So. Yep. Yep. Totally agree. So Jose, where does that, where does, where do all those lengthy answers leave you in terms of what you were thinking about? Um, well, it, kind of nowhere. I mean, it, nothing, nothing moved um, in the sense that uh, anything's changed. Uh, it's we're still saying these are good things, but that means we need to create them. Um, and I'm wondering if we go with the marketing in order to accelerate as a forcing function to accelerate the first part. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, because if, if, if we can paint a picture of work that we're doing and how it's being done differently in, in, in the, I think the big picture of neo books, not the little picture of neo books, not the nuggets and the this is mm -hmm. and the that's is, mm -hmm. but the big picture of open, transparent, um, transmissible, playable, you know, the all of these kinds of big picture ideas. Um, I think that's really the thing we want to benefit from, fit from. It's not the the little nugget stuff, right? The little nugget stuff is just how you can make it happen, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think that big picture, and and maybe hacking the work we're already doing into a hacked version of a neo book. There's also just wireframe mockups. I mean, d what? demos demos are just demos sometimes. They don't have to have working code uh, in order to light people up on what's going on. So, and and what that's what I'm wondering. I mean, not even uh, wireframe it, but but actually take these books, identify the nuggets, produce a nugget in multiple um, formats. Here it is in this format. Here it is in that format. Here it is in that format. Here's how somebody can engage with it. Here's somebody, and and actually build a real world mockup of of a neo book in action mm -hmm. or neo books in action, mm -hmm. and and then go have go do a little bit of roadshow. Let's go talk to folks and and tell them about what this thing is, and maybe that then causes us to actually have a better picture of what people see, what we see, and what we can build. I like that. Anyone else thoughts? Does that make sense to you guys, David, Klaus, Stacy? Yeah, I think we're saying the same thing. Uh, uh, Jose, we have been talking about let's do a platform, right, and uh, and and find ways to uh, set up different books, maybe by topic, whichever way, topic or title or whatever, and then let people engage and interact with these books. And then each interaction can be slightly different. So, so I don't I don't know what what uh, uh, Jerry what what uh, what is holding us back there. Why 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 are we not moving on this? Um, so for getting out and sort of beating the drum and getting some attention on this, we need a couple of minimal demos for how this thing works and what it is like. The thing that Jose just described, and I think I'm on the critical path for that. I think I need to create something that just shows what it is we're talking about in whatever way it could just be hand waving and finger pup shadow puppets on the wall but, <laughs> but sometimes shadow puppets on the wall does the job right 
Um, so I'm happy to, to, to take a swing at that. Uh, but I think that's the thing we're missing at this point. We're certainly missing a bunch of code, but nobody will know what code is necessary or they might want to help us write if they don't know what the singing and dancing looks like. We need to illustrate the singing and dancing part. So I, I, I agree a lot with that. Thank you. And getting the word out about that. So one thing that occurs to me is uh, this Thursday is the OGM call is uh, scheduled for check-in, but we don't have a topic for the following Thursday. I could use facilitators prerogative and say, hey, we're going to give you a Neobooks update uh, in two Thursdays. And that would force me to come up with the demo and do whatever else uh, to, to go do that. And I, 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 could, I could do that. I would say we could do that. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, we could build one. Or a small set of them or something like that. But yeah. Yeah, in my case, Jose, I'm definitely going to continue the conversations with the folks I've been talking to and see if that develops into anything that we're going to create. I guess I'm still a little... So what, Jerry, when you describe what's the, the most important part of the Neobooks concept, like what is, what is it? What's the magic? It's basically that the nuggets are alive in community, that the ideas are being improved the way a good wiki page is improved over time. Uh, that's the heart of the concept. That, that I don't I don't want to make it any more complicated than that. But that but that you know some some piece of uh, some some piece of an idea lives in some place where people engage with it and make it better over time and link it to other things and then use it in their publications in their presentations in their whatever in their storytelling. But it's just that the that the nuggets are alive. For yeah, me, and I actually think that. Sorry, I, I think the book concept might be. Kind of counter to that, right? Because the, the, the book, book is, the tends book to is, lock something down. And that's a point we make, actually. It's like, thank you for buying this book. It is a snapshot of a much more interesting community that is alive right now around the content that is in this book. So that, that's a point that the introduction I've written for the first Neo book that I'm writing says very explicitly. And we've had a, a few conversations here about why books? Why books at all? And the reason for books is that they're very well-known cultural artifacts that act to attract people to ideas, which is great. That's perfect. We want that. And so for me, the way I've been thinking about it is we shouldn't print a Neo book um, unless we actually explicitly have uh, nuggets as, as a, an offline way of, of of engaging with them so here's well, offline, this offline or online sorry uh, off book off book. Uh, yes perfect that's what you mean uh yeah. off book way of doing it and so totally agree totally agree and and that the, that thing is open and people can there's a way for them to take it there's a way for them to engage with it there's a way for them to um to contribute to it and in, in multiple ways to me, the, it, it's it's about saying a book's BS because it's all locked down in a bunch of pages that are copyrighted. And we want to use the book because you know what a book is, but every single one of these pages, you can go ahead and tear out and run with. The other thing that I really love is... <laughs> that one looks a little too evil for me. Doesn't it? Um, it does yeah. do the little, the slightly evil thing. But I like it. Um, so we'll, the, we'll just go with the one, the one thing that I really love that I think is a real potential for this is um, that the book itself could in itself be um, published as a neo book and said, this don't keep this book. Right. You cannot keep this book. Here's the list of people who you've given it to and that they've given it to and that they're going to keep giving it to and what contributions they want to make or not make or have made or whatever. Some mechanism within the physical book itself that absolutely says this isn't about you having bought a book and putting it on a shelf. Right. These ideas are too important to us for them to be locked between two bindings and stuck between two books. Um, 
a few, I don't know, four, five, six calls ago, we had a kind of an awkward call where I was like, let's talk about how people interact with nuggets. And I got a little geeky on us and it just, it just didn't work at all. And I reported back on the following call, gosh, I'm sorry that I took you down the journey last time. That was my attempt to get us to think through how anybody can interact with nuggets. And that's really important. And I think Pete and I decided we need to sort that out on the side by ourselves because it's a little too geeky a subject. But that was really my attempt to do that so that by the time we publish an ebook, which is a snapshot frozen in time like Han Solo locked in carbonite, uh, that's my favorite analogy for this, um, you really want to talk to Han. You don't want Han Solo you know, frozen in carbonite. Um, and so we need to figure we need to figure that out. We need to make that work at least in some very light way, uh, as you just said, uh, simultaneously with the publication of a, of a neo book. Because just a neo book that's yet another book that doesn't let you do that is not interesting. Nor nor does it give us a way to see what a neo book can be. Bingo. And and all we're doing is sort of doing another book. And, and that kind of defeats the purpose. In, in fact, I think it kind of breaks the idea of if you say, here's a regular published book and it's a neo book and it, it doesn't, doesn't have any of those features, then I think we've sort of defined a neo book in the wrong way, which means anybody who runs across that term goes, oh, it's just another book. These guys are nuts, right? Right. And it only it, it only tackles a third of the value, not it, it misses two thirds of the actual value. Because if it's a book, but then some you see another book that shares chapters, that's interesting, but it's minor. It's it's not big compared to the big idea. Yeah, I need to run. I'm sorry. Yeah, we're at the end of our time. Any anybody with any wrapping thoughts? Stacy, you, you, <laughs> you have a wrapping thought. Go for it. It's it, it's not wrapping. It's unwrapping. Um, ah, nice. Maybe I'm missing the point, but what I hear being asked for, couldn't we do that in practice with what Klaus already created? I mean, there are parts in there that are about methodology. There are parts in there that mention spiral dynamics. Maybe I'm not understanding what you guys are trying to do, but if I were with 12 people and I said, all right, everybody pick one part, just as an exercise, like a schoolroom exercise, is that not what you're talking about? So because Klaus's manuscript is currently, uh, see you, Jose, because Klaus's manuscript is currently in Google Docs, the only actual way to interact with it is if he gives somebody permission to comment on his Google Doc. You wouldn't want to give anybody edit permission. When so I, I guess what I'm thinking about, not the written part of it, I'm thinking about the just the the speaking part of it, just right? to. So I wouldn't be able to do the technical part. I wouldn't know how to write it, but I'd be able to, as one individual, say, this is the part that I would take. Right. And then know who would want to gather around that part. Somebody else might say, this is the part of it that interests me. And they would gather around that part of it. Just as a pre, just like that's the pre yeah, the prerequisite. So then <laughs> you know what the different things are you can decide how to do the next step as a team cuz somebody on a team will have tech will have technical knowledge one hopes yes so so there's only two ways i can envision right this second how that would work and they both require a place to converge around the topic the nugget one of them is in text the other one is if we had this call recording and we took a segment of the recording, a piece of a short snippet of video, and then talked around that short snippet of video. That's the only, that's the other way. That's the way I'm recommend. Like that's what I've always wanted to see and don't have the words for. That's the piece that I think is really important for community building and relationships and learning and a whole bunch of other stuff. <laughs> so, so would you love to see? a video-based conversation among a, a bunch of different people interested in a topic, and basically they're each sharing video snippets in? Yes, I would. And then I could, I mean, honestly, that's how I found my way into different calls and environments that I'm in. I was able to watch it. I was able to see who I was drawn to. I was able to go there. Yeah, I think that's really important and empowers a lot of people.
So I'm with you. The part of the problem I see is that the videos that we mostly talk about are long videos of podcasts or whatever, and they don't nuggetize easily at all online. They're, it's very hard to talk around a short piece unless the author of said podcast created a bunch of YouTube shorts or Instagram reels or whatever, in which case then the nuggets are tiny enough because YouTube short has to be under 60 seconds, for example, uh, or TikTok or whatever. And then you can kind of talk around that, but then those little pieces aren't connected back to the larger piece they came from easily either. So the problem with doing this as a video conversation is that sort of woven video conversations aren't easily implemented online. It's not impossible, but it's not pretty with what we've got on the table right now. It doesn't flow very well. So I hear, I hear you, and I wish I had that. And earlier when I said, wouldn't it be great if, if Zoom gave us the ability to create little chapters and then clippings? Because there yeah. is a clipping flavored thing. It doesn't thing. work well. It just doesn't really work. So, so none of those things are working to make the nugget aggregation thing um, happy for participants, which is a great goal. Okay. Uh, just wanted David, to throw it David, out there because I thought maybe I wasn't understanding properly. Yeah. David Klaus, does this uh, make sense to you? Do you have any different opinions on that? Or? Honestly, I didn't quite follow. Uh, uh, so, no, I don't have an opinion. All right. We can go back uh, back to it next week. We should wrap the call soon. Dave, any thoughts? Well, I was curious. I mean, kind of on the same spirit, is there is, is there no way to reverse engineer Klaus books back into Obsidian kind of? I mean, or at least do the first section or something to test? So Pete and, I, Pete and I tested that. We basically took uh, Klaus's manuscript and started trying to break it up into, into nuggets in Obsidian. And there were a bunch of hidden... Uh, uh, hidden uh, commands in, in Google Doc that show up when you do the first export. So we didn't have time to go back and troubleshoot how to actually sort of clean it up. But the concept was to just somehow automatically break the book up into uh, nuggets that would then live as a, as a markdown files. Yes. My, my suspicion is that you're trying to force a structure onto something that's not the way people live. It's, it's not a living systems model. You're trying to create a reductionist model out of nuggets. Actually, I don't, think, context... I, don't, I don't think so at all, but I have to prove it to you. Yeah, exactly. But I think the con that's why that was my original opposition to nuggets, which is, like I said, dates back to the World Bank's knowledge management platform, which was all nugget based. Hmm. And the, there was just a golden nuggets, no less, but they were going to be the knowledge bank. And so they would have bank of knowledge. Nuggets. Um, and the nuggets just don't work without a whole bunch of context. And so I think they're going to look like uh, Klaus's newsletter and that people aren't going to be able to contribute meaningfully into a nugget. It, it's just really hard. So how They're do very we, how, rare? So wikis work pretty well when you have a wikis good wiki. don't work. Hardly any wikis at all work. Well, <laughs> this has been like our Wikipedia works. I Wikipedia guess Wikipedia works great. For yeah. well, it works fine. Very very few people contribute to Wikipedia, and it's got a huge overhead to it. Right? I mean, it works, but this is this is what got back to. I really think we should go back and revisit some of our our knowledge from 20 years ago, because the things we thought were 20 years ago, they haven't been replicated a lot, you know, mm -hmm. and Wiki Wikipedia is one, you just don't see a bunch of Wikipedia's lying around, you know, well, and yeah. I think it's really hard to get a, a wiki to work like Wikipedia did. I don't know why, the question should be, why did Wikipedia work? Yeah. Not, not how you do it again. Like, and uh, Pete has blood in that race because he was a co-founder of Social Text, which was a company selling wikis to corporations that eventually didn't make it. Yeah, I just, I mean, anyway, so I, I just think that, that I would, I'd be, yeah, so. All right, was... a, a good question for us to address going forward. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye for now. Jared. Yes. Stop recording? Yes, except... Uh...